Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. Oh, did get off? People sometimes don't know who we are or what we are until they need us, and then we're there. And that's just the most wonderful feeling ever. Nice one. Some of the easiest types of calls to learn from are the box call and the slate call, because literally you're rubbing a friction against one another to make the call of a hen turkey. We can actually time the, the best time to take those eggs and to fertilize them. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchase of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks, Guts, Glory, Ram. Throughout Texas, almost 500 game wardens patrol the back country and the waterways of our state. They have the same authority as any other law enforcement officer, but there's a big difference. Wardens protect our natural resources and their day-to-day -day responsibilities are as varied as the communities where they live and work. How far up we want to go all the way? Johnny Longoria is a warden assigned to the Texas Environmental Crimes Task Force. Who better to protect the natural resources than state game wardens? Today, he's on pollution patrol. We're going down channel. Therefore. Wardens are here in the Houston Ship Channel because environmental hazards are every bit the threat to fish and wildlife as poachers. We have job security because there's enough work out there. We could use a few more of us as well. Jonathan Gray is a warden on a stakeout. <sighs> We've had a long-term surveillance on this particular site in front of us. They're using it to dump wastewater treatment sludge. They have a permit, except they're not following the permit guidelines. Sometimes 10 trucks coming out here a day, multiply that by 8,000 gallons, that's enough to make a river roll on its own. And sometimes working undercover means flying overhead. I love flying and it's, and it's fun and it's just a part of the job. I'd rather be in the air than on the ground, i would be honest with you. <laughs> You've seen what wardens do by air and by land. This is what they do by sea. Enforce our fishing law. Good morning, State Game Warden. Henry Balderamas is one such officer. How are you doing this morning? Wondering if we could take a look at your fish here. Uh, that's OK. Right it's now. OK? Yeah. Thank you, sir. Commercial fishing is a multi-billion dollar business, and boats that don't follow the rules threaten the entire industry. Could I take a look at your license, please? You'll always have the folks that want to go ahead and try to take more than what they should versus the folks that walk that straight line and say, no, you know, I'm, I'm not going to do that. All right. Thank you, Mr. Wynn. You guys have a good day. Thank you very much. It's up to us to go out there to make sure that no one is taking more than what they should so that industry will continue to thrive. In a nutshell, that's who we are, is we are protecting the natural resources for use today and for use tomorrow. How you do, sir? Stay game, warden. You doing okay? Dornell Crist is one of many wardens who patrol the lakes of Texas. Want to do a water safety check, make sure you got everything you need. Dornell's job is to inspect the equipment on a boat. Okay. He's also on the lookout for intoxicated boaters. How many beers have you had today? And he may have just found one. 
Do you know your ABCs from A to Z? Yes, sir. Can you sing them without singing them? A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Uh, don't sing them. I want you to say them for me. After some exercises to assess the man's sobriety. Can I start over, man? I'm going to ask you now to go ahead. You're going to board my boat. He's taken ashore for more extensive tests. And when I tell you to, I want you to follow the tip of my pen with your eyes, your eyes only. Do you understand? Yes, sir. A boating while intoxicated citation carries the same legal weight as one issued for driving a car while intoxicated. Am I doing all right, man? Go ahead. Your driver's license can be suspended and you can go to jail. Okay, sir, go ahead. Put your hand down. Here we place under arrest and taken to the Limestone County Jail. Our job is to make sure everybody can enjoy the resources safely. We take pride in that. We take pride. Uh, we don't like taking people to jail, but if it keeps someone safe, then it's for me. Often, it is game wardens who are among the first responders following a natural disaster. We got our assignment was to go to the downtown area of New Orleans. So we launched our boats and was getting people out by airboat, by flat bottom boats. We would go down into the communities that were flooded and begin to go from house to house, street to street. Hello? Uh, this is extremely uh, emotional situation to go and work something like this. I guarantee you before it's all said and done, I'm probably going to break down and have a big cry. The wardens work long and hard hours, and I'll say this, there's not a game warden out there who isn't ready to answer the call. Because that's what law enforcement is all about. In, in this profession, it's about dealing with people and providing service to people. But in providing this service, wardens occasionally put themselves in harm's way. And there's the inherent risk of walking into an unknown situation. How you boys doing? I'm Carl, state game warden. How are you? That's generally not a problem for Arthur McCall. They check your license if I could. He's been a warden for nearly four decades. John, everything looks good. And he knows most of the hunters in his jurisdiction. To me, it's a, a real satisfying job. And the reason I say that, I have landowners in this area that I've dealt with for years, and they refer to me as their game warden. Hello. And if that won't make you stand up and smile, nothing will. But being involved in one's community takes time and effort. Come on around, guys. How are you guys doing today? You having a good time? How many of y'all have been fishing before? Raise your hand. Good, a lot of y'all. Does anybody know why these deer horns are different here on the bottom? This large fish on the top, can anybody tell me what it is? And raise your hand. We're fixing to go boating, but first he needs to wear a life jacket, right? So we're gonna put a life jacket on him. Zip it up. This is Pinky Gonzalez's favorite part of the job, acting as an ambassador of sorts, promoting outdoor safety. So is this guy ready to go? There's a lot of kids, they love the outdoors. But along with enjoying the outdoors, there's a, a safety factor involved in it. And uh, I think safety is very, very important. Our job is moving more and more towards conservation and safety. Each year, we end up with more people utilizing the resource, which our job becomes more vital. And that's what our job is, to educate you all and to tell you what you need. You got to hang on to it. Hang on to your rod. Oh, to get off. There's another big one. Whenever we make their experience a positive experience, including bringing kids out and taking them fishing and taking them hunting. It's a nice one. We are ensuring that people continue to utilize the resource in a responsible manner. Oh, somebody's got one. Gavin, that's three. You did good. This is for me. This is what I want to do because I love the outdoors, I love law enforcement, and I love people and this job gives you the opportunity to do all three. People sometimes don't know who we are or what we are until they need us, and then we're there. And that's just the most wonderful feeling ever. Hi, today we're gonna learn about turkey calling. And turkey calling is really as simple as rubbing two sticks together. Anyone can learn it, you can learn it really quickly. 
There's basic types of turkey calls and there's a few complex calls as well. Some of the easiest types of calls to learn from are the box call and the slate call because literally you're rubbing a friction against one another to make the call of a hen turkey. Now you want a call of a hen turkey to try to attract the tom or male turkey over to your position. And a hen turkey has very many types of calls. In fact, I've heard 26 calls, but we're gonna learn about three today that'll enable you to call in a tom. One is called the basic cluck. Now a cluck is, is a call that says, hi, I'm here. And if you put the cluck in a series of calls, it would be the yelp. Now a yelp call is a series of clucks that says, I'm here, come over here, I'm having fun. Now a slate call is much the same as a box call. You rub a peg against a piece of slate and you can make that basic cluck or cut sound. And you can also make a purr or something that's kind of sweet and says, I'm feeding, I'm scratching, I'm on my daily, daily rounds. And a purr is a nice little call to use, especially if the gobbler is close to you. Now I like to use a diaphragm call. It's a little more complicated call, but it allows me, if I'm hunting, to move my arms and hands with my bow or my gun and it's because it fits in the top of your mouth and you can do it quite easily, but it takes some practice to learn how to use a diaphragm call. That was a cackle or a yelp, and a cackle or a yelp are things that attract birds. If you hear a putt, though, that'll scare a bird away, and that's the alarm call. Now putting them all together, you can have fun imitating a flock of turkeys. And as you do that, you learn more about turkey behavior and turkey, and you can have fun hunting or even simply photographing and watching turkeys. I hope you learn about turkey calling today. Have fun calling. It all started here, on a small plot of land near Waco. Pat Neff grew up around this area. His mother was very popular out here. She provided six acres along the Leon River for special public functions, religious revivals, and things of that sort. People really came to love this woman. When Pat Neff, her youngest son, became governor, he actually wanted to preserve these beauty spots of Texas for others to come out and enjoy. And so Mother Neff State Park became the first official state park in Texas. We have a real nice trail system. Cool. There's some interesting stops that a hiker would want to visit. You'll actually see some remnants of one particular rock shelter that was used by Native Americans. So do you think maybe they have their campfire right here? We do have a unique situation in this park. We've got actually three ecosystems. Uh, the river bottom, the limestone escarpment, and then you get up to the prairie. As a junior ranger, I pledge that kids who love exploring can become junior rangers through a free, self-guided nature program. We're gonna pin a badge on you. Congratulations. The legacy of Mother Neff gave birth to our state park system, giving Texans of all ages a chance to experience the great outdoors. Assemble upright poles. I, I think people need that, a little balance in their life. <laughs> We're really tickled there's a market of people that still like that kind of outdoor experience. Oh yeah, we got a tent. <laughs> I love camping. <laughs> Most people are attracted to the natural beauty of the park. People come from all over just to get away from some of the hectic things in life. We love it down here. You could go 500 miles and not find a prettier place.
When most people go fishing, they use a rod and reel. When the inland fisheries crew from Parks and Wildlife goes fishing, they use electricity. They search for one particular type of fish, the striped bass, Moroni saxatilis, AKA rockfish and sea bass. Sea bass? What are they doing here? 80 miles inland, below Lake Livingston, in the fresh water of the Trinity River. You got to remember, most of the water in Texas is man-made. The systems that were there before, before the, the building of dams and, and the creating of reservoirs, we had a few large rivers and, and a lot of intermittent streams. Uh, the fish that, that inhabited those, uh, those streams and rivers w weren't always suited for what the new habitat that was created in these large reservoirs. So we had some opportunities to look at some different things. For instance, the striped bass and, and uh, the hybrid stripers and, and some of these other species were brought in to fill a niche that the native species weren't gonna fill. Striped bass, or stripers, are like salmon, a saltwater fish that spawns in freshwater, with one notable exception. When it was discovered uh, in South Carolina and some of those places, when they built some dams on some of those major rivers where stripers lived, they migrated up those streams. When they built these reservoirs, these stripers got landlocked, and they did well. So that was an indication that the stripers could survive and would do well in freshwater impoundments. So we got some of the fish, I believe they were from South Carolina, and brought them to Texas and began experimenting with them in some of our lakes. Each year, we have a large population of striped bass that congregates below Lake Livingston Dam. We discovered that population in 1981, and we've been using it as the primary source for broodfish for the entire state since then. We use our electrofishing boats, and uh, they're very effective. It's just a, a method by which we stun the fish, makes them unable to swim, and they'll actually swim towards our electrodes, and we can dip them out of the water. They remain stunned for several minutes. There's no you know, damage to the fish. They revive, and we take them back to the hatchery for our spawning process. And we can pick and choose. Males and females go into separate tanks and the condition of each is judged for reproductive potential. Those that don't meet the requirements go right back into the river. With a little experience, you can learn pretty quickly uh, which ones appear to be eligible uh, based on the size, uh, the, the distension of the stomach, you know, how full of eggs they look, and also the vent. But the egg sample actually is the proof of the pudding. We actually take eggs and put them under the microscope we can tell how far along in their development they are, and, and then we actually decide whether they're going to be injected with hormones and loaded onto the trailer. The process of, of catching the fish, hauling the fish, actually stops the ovulation process. The, the hormone injection begins that process again and puts it on a, on a fairly predictable schedule. We can pretty much predict when that fish will spawn. Each fish has an individual number and a color code. They're marked with a piece of flagging, or maybe two or three pieces of flagging, that distinguish that particular fish. And that fish can be tracked all the way from beginning to end. 110 yellow. All the males will be yellow. It's a combined effort of a lot of different people. We have a lot of hatchery staff there. We have a lot of management staff. We usually have uh, two or three shocking boats working at any one time. It's a, it's a real combined effort each year, and it's, uh, a lot of it's, it's the highlight of our year. 20.9. Kennedy River Authority, they have been outstanding since day one. They provide a lot of manpower and intimate weather. Without their manpower and equipment, we couldn't get in and out. Just any, any aspect of what we do, they're always right there to help us. The selected fish go to either the Dundee Fish Hatchery near Wichita Falls or the Possum Kingdom Fish Hatchery west of Fort Worth. Inside the hatchery, the females are sequestered in one set of tanks, and the males wait in another. Then the waiting begins. For 32 years, Eduardo Nunez has worked at the Possum Kingdom Fish Hatchery, 
At least two hours. Knowing just when the time is right to take the eggs is critical to the process. This one's just about ready. Orange is just about ready, another 15, 20 minutes. It's an artificial fertilization process. Uh, we have the males, we have the females, so we have the sex products. It's just a matter of knowing when to, to unite those two to get uh, the embryo started. We can actually time the, the best time to take those eggs and to fertilize them. If you take them too early, they won't fertilize. If you take them too late, they won't fertilize. There's a window of opportunity there, but it's not a, a wide window. So uh, it does take some experience. The fertilized eggs go into hatching jars that maintain a constant circulation of fresh water. In 48 hours, the eggs hatch into fry, which are held for an additional three to five days while their mouths develop. After 30 to 45 days in the rearing ponds, the fry have grown into fingerlings, one and a half inches in length, and are ready for stocking. Some fingerlings are the result of breeding with white bass males and are called hybrids. These go into 40 to 50 lakes around the state. The purebred stripers go into a few select lakes that are now known as striper lakes. What we found after experimenting with these animals for several years, the fish were surviving, but we weren't getting the population levels up to the, the point where they were creating a quality fishery. So we made a decision about 10 years ago to limit the, the locations uh, for striper stocking. And I believe now we're down to 11 to 12 lakes that we consider striper lakes. And we put all of our production in those 11 to 12 lakes. These are striped bass, and we take them out into open water. Uh, stripers are an open water fish, and we take them out and, and uh, put them in their own habitat that they're going to live the rest of their life in. And uh, it also keeps them away from a lot of the uh, smaller fish around the bank that will feed on them when we stock them there. We don't touch them with a the net. We try not to after we got them in the boat. And that, we feel that's just less stressful on the fish. What we've created is some fisheries so that if you want to catch a striper, you go to one of these lakes and your chances of catching one real good, and, and it, that's worked well for us. Well, the end result is that we're producing basically seven and a half million fish that would not be here otherwise because these fish, for the most part, do not reproduce naturally in the state of Texas. These are some good looking fish. Today, fishing is big business. In 1996 alone, anglers spent over $2.8 billion in Texas on recreational fishing. To help support this popular pastime, the Inland Fisheries staff produce over 20 million fish each year for stocking in Texas waters. Striped bass are just one aspect of the department's effort to make fishing in Texas accessible and successful for anybody that wants to wet a line. There he is. All right. Oh, that's a good fish there now. That's the bottom line, is uh, getting the fish on the end of that line.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchase of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.